Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our NYU Law Venture Fund event with Eric Berry. Eric is a graduate of the class of 2008, and he is the CEO of Triple Lift. Before we get things started, I just want to quickly tell you all a little bit about what we have coming up with the fund, and then we'll jump right into the conversation today. A few housekeeping notes. I'm sure we're all familiar now with how Zoom works, but just in case um, you're curious, at the bottom of your screens, you should see options under more for Q&A. Uh, so you can uh, use that option to ask any questions. Uh, unfortunately, we can do this in person, but we certainly want to make this as engaging as possible and we want this to be a dialogue. So uh, I'll certainly be asking Eric a number of questions, but would love to hear from each and every one of you and feel free to use that function whenever you would like. I'm gonna quickly uh, share my screen here and um, just let you, a little bit, let you all know a little bit about the Venture Fund. Um, and if you're not aware, uh, the fund's mission is to empower our students and our alumni by uniting, educating, and investing in promising entrepreneurs and their startups. And to do so, we offer a variety of different programs. Uh, a few of them are aimed towards our students, and then we certainly have programs for alumni as well. The student programs include our summer internships, which allow for 1L students after their first year to intern at an emerging startup. Uh, we have two interns who are gonna be working at startups this summer. And then our summer grants program, which actually um, the application deadline is this week, uh, which allowed for 1L and 2L students to spend a summer working on their own business idea. Eric, thank you. I know over the past two years, you've been a mentor for those students over the summer. So really appreciate your involvement with that. And then for alumni who are, and students who are building early stage companies and are looking to raise seed stage capital, we also make investments into their seed stage fundraising rounds up to 50K in check sizes. We've made two investments so far. And so if you're interested in that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And then certainly we do a whole host of events and look to connect our community as well. I'll mention one upcoming program that we have that's open for all students, both JDs and LLMs, that's uh, gonna be taking place at the end of March. It's a business plan competition. We'll be awarding um, some cash prizes, more information to come on that, and there's some information here on the screen. But with that, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Eric. Um, Eric, as I mentioned, is the co-founder and CEO of Triple Lift. I'm not gonna read Eric's bio here because I want us to have a conversation, but just wanted to share a little bit about who Eric is and what his background is. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting, Eric, just to perhaps share what your background is on your Twitter account, which says CEO of Triple Lift, former M&A lawyer, sarcastic New York. And I think th those are, Terrific ways to introduce you. So welcome, uh, Eric. We're thrilled to have you. Um, since I haven't done a full-on introduction, why don't you tell the, tell everybody who's here this afternoon a bit more about yourself? I think that that sums it up. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess uh, in a little more detail, um, uh, maybe biographically. Yeah. Um, did undergrad and grad school in computer science at MIT, did AmeriCorps for a year. Uh, then I went to NYU Law. Um, and I honestly had no idea um, what part of law or anything. Like, you know, some people go in and they're like, I want to be a constitutional or something or whatever. And I was not one of those people. Um, and I kind of got like steered in the business direction. Um, there is a program that I think is now called the Jacobson program in law and business. And at that time was called something different. And I did that and that was great. That was great. Uh, and that was very helpful for me. Um, I, I went to work at Simpson Thatcher uh, for a couple of years. I would not say that was my favorite experience. Uh, and then I left to uh, go to an, an ad tech startup in New York called AppNexus, and I was one of the first 40 people there. Subsequently sold to AT&T for like 1.6 billion, and then I started Triple Lift um, in 2012, so almost 10 years ago now, and uh, with two guys I met from there, and we've been doing that. Great. Thank you, Eric, and a lot that I'd like to unpack 
in that. Uh, so maybe we can just spend a little bit of time uh, to those days while you were at law school. Why did you descend, decide to attend NYU Law? Um, yeah, I mean, I think NYU had, had so having just come from AmeriCorps, um, you know, I think it, like NYU had, had a very good public interest program and that was, uh, that was something I was interested in and it also had a very good corporate program. And I knew that I had this ambivalence between those two directions. Uh, you can see which one out, but um, the, I, I felt like NYU would be a good place for me to explore uh, that ambivalence uh, in a place that could help me succeed in either. And that led you to Simpson to start. Yeah. And I know, I know you've talked a lot about your experience at Simpson, but I'm curious specifically about the, the time that you spent there. How did you feel about the work that you were doing and what led you to want to leave? So I, I don't want to like say anything bad about my old firm, which I think, you know, for what it is, it's, it's great. It just wasn't for me. And, um, I, some people are really passionate about the work and some people really like it. And I was not one of those people. And I think that was like very evident to me very early on. Um, and I got no satisfaction from it. And so, you know, I think, uh, I, I, when I was at Simpson, I was like, if I'm going to hate my life, I might as well make more money doing that. And so I took the CFA exams and then I was like, wait, no, this is a terrible idea. This is like, this is not how to operate. Um, and so then, uh, I went and, and I was like, you know, my passion's always been in tech. I should like do. And so I, I think that there is in fact real value for me having done the legal experience in that I always think of it as like, um, it was really helpful for me to like, you know, you take, you go to these law firms and it's, it's a lower risk path to, if you want to be able to make a good amount of money in a fairly predictable course. And you just have to like hunker down and like do it. Um, and to me that, that trade off of, you know, that good career with a good compensation was not worth um, what would come along with it. And so it made me think a lot about what my passions really were and how I would pursue that in the best way for me. And that led you to AppNexus. Yeah. Um, but, before, <laughs> but before we talk about that, you know, I, it, and you may know this already, Eric, but just so everybody else is aware, we have a mix of folks attending this conversation, right? So we have a few current students, we have a few admitted students, we have alumni who graduated across a number of years. I think your experience um, of being at the law firm in the early years and finding that it's not something you want to do for the long run is not uncommon. Others go through that as well. And uh, it's quite interesting that you went ahead and got your CFA license, but I'm really curious to just learn a little bit more about how you identified AppNexus as the next place, and then in more detail, how you were able to get your first role there. Because a lot of times people struggle to figure that out. And that's a really hard leap to make. And then to your other point, it's easier perhaps to stay at the firm, even though you may not be enjoying it or one may not enjoy it as much, given that it's a bit more of a secure route. So how did you figure all of that out and process through making that decision? Yeah, I mean, Honestly, um, the day I, the day I quit Simpson was like, I was most one, it was one of the most difficult things for me. And, uh, you know, I was making like whatever, and I moved to Nexus and I made like that over two or three or something. And, um, and I had just like gotten engaged and my wife's dad was like, um, so um, you know, ultimately, uh, Abnexus was, was a step and I didn't know that it was a step. Um, 
but it, it was in the sense that I had a vision of myself running a tech company at one day, at one point. And um, I think it would have been hard to go from working at a firm to running a tech company because the gap between what you do in those two jobs is enormous. Um, and Nexus really helped me because it was, it was 40 people when I started or so, and it was about 200 when I left. And um, it, was, it was a rapid growth company uh, that did some things really well and some things really poorly. And Simpson also did some, some things really well and some things really poorly. But you certainly get a very different view. The way tech companies are run is super different. Um, and I think that was, that was invaluable. Um, I've since forgotten the question that I'm answering, but um, perhaps it can be, uh, how did you end up at, at AppNexus? Was that, does that feel right? Correct. Okay, great. Um, and as it relates to that question, you know, I, I ultimately wanted to be at an early-ish tech company that was promising. So I looked at uh, VC portfolios um, in the New York area by, you know, uh, at a stage of investment that I thought was right by well-reputed firms, created a, a spreadsheet, you know, there's no, you just got to put the work in and, yeah. and applied and applied and applied. And I'm Nexus, you know, I didn't get the best job going in there, but I had committed to myself that, you know, one, you get, one of the things you get from working at corporate law is like a, a work, uh, uh, a commitment to, to working, uh, work ethic that uh, is largely unparalleled and, um, you know, maybe investment banking or whatever, but those are like the two professions where you're going to work like the most. And um, I was committed that, you know, I was, I was going to work hard and I was going to be smart and I was going to be thoughtful and I was going to, I was going to come out in a really good spot. And I did, I got promoted like three times in the two years I was there, I was leading a, a like on the day, on the day I started, I, you know, on the prior day, I was like at, you know, one of the top law firms in the country. And then on the next day, I was, um, I was support. So a technical support, which is like, you know, not the top job there. And I'm a guy that, you know, douchiness aside, I have an undergrad and grad school from MIT and computer science. I was working at a top, top law firm. And then I'm like doing tech support. And I like, I didn't feel great about that. Um, and, uh, but I, I did feel great about my chances if I put my heart into it and put my head into it and like, you know, worked hard and, and it, I, I was right. And, um, that got me to the point where I was able to start my own tech company. I, I, I learned enough about what was going on and how to do things and everything. And, you know, that, that, that's what it took. It's like swallowing pride and getting there. I've heard you share this on a number of occasions at a variety of other events. And I think even in stories that you've done for the law school, Eric, right? It's, it's quite a humbling move to, as you said, right? Two degrees from MIT, a law degree, a JD from NYU Law. You're an associate at a firm. And here you are now doing tech support at AppNexus. Did you know anything about the space that you were entering? And how did you go about understanding the business that you were working at? So... I knew nothing about this space, but so I was actually choosing between Google, which is like big, big co, you know, and, and then Nexus, which is not. And now, despite now owned by at and but then it was like nothing. And one of the things I liked about AppNexus was it had a founder who had a previously sold a company who had previously, like he wasn't the founder, but he was like the CTO of a company that sold to Yahoo for like 700 million. And he was subsequently financed by like Vinod Kosla and Sequoia and blah, 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 Andreessen. So um, it was a highly regarded company by a successful founder uh, who was doing something that was really unique in the industry. And I didn't have a full appreciation for what that meant precisely, but um, those were like important checkboxes for me. Great. And I was gonna, yeah. Great. So while you're there, you meet your now current co-founders of Triple Lift. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about how that came about 
and how you three form the initial ideas around starting your own company. Yeah. Well, do you want the revisionist history version or the, the correct this is, this is your event. So give us, give us whatever you'd like. <laughs> They're not here. Right. <laughs> they may listen to this though. So just remember yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, uh, we, my two co-founders were two of the people that I thought were just the best at the company. So uh, some of the smartest and hardworking, most hardworking people and they, the company hired pretty well. And so, you know, if I was going to go into business with people, these, these were people. Um, and admittedly, like I didn't know them super well, but which I feel it's like a weird thing, you know, but <laughs> like starting a business in many ways is, I'm 10 years in and I see these people more than I see my wife and it's like a pretty deep relationship. So perhaps in retrospect, uh, you know, should have spent more time there, but notwithstanding that they are great, right? They're absolutely great. I just want to point out that like, you should be committed to like a decade with whoever you start a business with. Um, and, um, you know, we candidly, we didn't know exactly what we were going to do. Uh, we actually applied to an accelerator. We, we applied to an accelerator, which was like the chronologically next accelerator, uh, that was taking applicants and we applied and, and like, you know, our, our application was just the most like arrogant kind of like weird thing. And we were just like this absurdly boastful in a way that I'm like mortified by, um, but whatever. And we were joking to each other, like, oh, the internet must be broken. Like we haven't gotten accepted yet. Um, and then we like got called in for the interview and we were like, hmm. Uh, and then they like told us how terrible our ideas were. And we we're like, I'm not sure that that went super well. Um, and then we got in uh, and immediately we were like, that idea was stupid. You guys should not have let us in. That was so stupid. Uh, and we like pivoted a whole bunch we actually got like a reputation for having pivoted the most time in an accelerator. You're supposed to like be in a, like accelerate, right. Not like come up with new ideas every couple of weeks. Um, but for us, it was at least like we got money. I had another job that I could have gone to. I could have gone back to have Nexus. Um, and it's really, 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 really hard. If not impossible. I, I don't know of any time that this has happened where people have like, worked on a job and nights and weekends, like a normal job and then done a startup and nights and weekends and had it become like a thing. Like normally people do that and then it just like tapers over time. Um, and so we needed to commit ourselves and my co-founder got into the Harvard business two by two program, which is like um, you defer your acceptance for a couple of years. And so my thing was like, I needed the company to be sufficiently successful to keep him from going to HBS. Um, and that took some time, but basically what, what we ended up doing was after we started, which generally this isn't the right order of operations, but after we started, we came up with an approach, like just a, a thesis. Uh, and then we implemented ideas against that thesis and almost all of them were stupid. In fact, all but one were stupid. In fact, we had a board meeting where we were like, okay, the previous idea was stupid that we talked about. Here are the next six ideas that we're thinking about. What do you guys think? And they were like, the first five are great. And the last one is stupid. Definitely don't do that last one. And we were like, we love you. You guys are so smart. Thanks so much. So we did that last one. And um, that's the one that we are now successful about. And now they're all like, yeah, we invested in that company because they were doing that idea. And we're like, no, you liars. We weren't even do it. Like we hadn't even come up with that idea. And you said no to it, but also, um, point being, uh, we didn't know it. Like, I think more often than not, I don't have the data to support this, but I feel more often than not that companies don't know exactly what they're going to do precisely how they're going to do it on the day they start. And they may have a sense of the problem they're thinking about, but they don't know exactly the best way to appeal to the general sensibilities of the general, like they might know how to appeal to the themselves solving that problem, but that might not be the way everybody else thinks about it. And so that solution may not be the best solution to go to market with or the best way or whatever. So it took us a lot of iterating. Um, in fact, about two years 
Um, and then, you know, we've been, we've been off to the races. So idea number six, the one that nobody believed in or thought was stupid, um, was what allowed you to start and launch. Triple That's Lift. the story of Triple Left, yeah. <laughs> Which is great. What was that idea? And this was 2012, and so much has happened in the advertising space since 2012. So can you tell us about what that idea was? And then what you well, do the today? kernel of the idea was that on social platforms, uh, people, well, yeah, on, on social platforms, when you go, they had gotten to this certain scale where they could create their own ad experience and, and having that ability, they didn't use banner ads. They created ads that were integrated into the user experience that were part of that look and feel. And that had the benefit of marketers could use better ad copy. It was better for users. Users spend more time and uh, have more sessions in this versus banner ads. And that's like quantitatively studied. And because of that, the publisher can make more money by virtue of better performing ads and more ads. Um, and that's great, these integrated ad experiences. And, and we said, what if we could bring that type of experience to the open internet, to every publisher, so that every publisher could design, instead of having banner ads off to the side where they flash and blink to get your, your attention, make it so that the publisher could design ads that were integrated into the user experience. So it would be a better, better user experience that's monetized in a way that's more friendly to their consumers where consumers are looking. So marketers could use better copy. And then of course, every publisher looks and feels totally different. So we'd have to create this technology that would make it so that with a single set of assets, marketers could automatically have it translated to the unique looks and feels of thousands of publishers. And, um, and that's, that's what we do. I mean, we do other things now, but that's what we got started with. Great. Eric, I think it's so impressive that over the past 12 years, Triple Lift has been recognized for a number of different accolades. I'm not gonna run through the exhaustive list here, but I wanna focus in a little bit about your role as CEO. You were named EY's Entrepreneur of the Year in 2019. And then I think most recently, the company was recognized by Deloitte, by Inc. And I think also by Cranes as one of the fastest growing companies for the fourth year in a row. So congrats, it's really, really terrific. Thanks. I, I, I want to hear more about your leadership style, how that has been formed over the years. And then also want to talk about how you've continued to manage such incredible growth. Uh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, my leadership style is something that's like a weird, like, I don't, I don't know, like, how do people talk about that? But um, I feel like it would be described by other people as, um, uh, I try to have a thoughtful process around decision-making. And so I try to, um, get a discussion around important points through enough points of view, um, and then have enough information expressed that a decision is is more clear as, and, and I, I am very much against like decisions in a single meeting and more decisions in like thoughtful documents um, where people have time to ruminate because whatever, that's one thing. Another thing is like being thoughtful about the individual experience. Um, and so I think people are very comfortable talking to me. I, I don't know that's a leadership style. I think that's just whatever, but like, um, and then Thinking about the individual experience means how do people relate to the company and how can you, because like ultimately we want to get the most out of our people and hire the best people, but like the first bit is super important. So how do you set people up to give you the most? And, um, and I think that's like a different, it's almost the uh, exact opposite equation from, from the law firm where the law firm is like, how do we extract the most from our people? And, and, and that's a different question than how do we get the most from our people which is like, how do we, and especially if you think about COVID times, like the relationship between an individual and their firm is, is almost inverted where my experience is what I choose to make of it uh, because like I'm at my computer at home and nobody knows what I'm doing all day. And, um, and so you have to make it so people want to um, give it their, their best and their best if they're thoughtful and intentional and mean well, 
is so much different than like if you like just like force the most hours of work product from them um and so I, yeah that, that's what i think about managing through growth is like you know we've grown our headcount 50 percent a year for a long time now uh and, and so every year we go through the same exercise and it's like robust planning about every little piece of the company and you know, I guess there's, there's a lot of like attention to detail and meticulousness that goes into our planning process. So like I spend months, months on planning um, and it like, it doesn't just happen that, you know, um, and so we think about, uh, you know, our, our, we are also a profitable company. Um, and so that, that planning goes hand in hand with like, it, that doesn't just happen. And so, you know, we think exactly about how people are going to onboard, for example, we think onboarding is one of the most important things. So we spent like months of time, like putting together uh, extensive onboarding. We have triple F, triple F university, which is like hundreds of courses that people go through when they start. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most important things because a lot of companies phone in onboarding. And I think that's just absolutely detrimental. And that's, I think, a very, very important part of somebody joining a team, right? How do you onboard them? What's their experience like, et cetera? Um, I just want to remind everyone, feel free to uh, pop in questions because I certainly want to include them. And Eric, I'll ask you one that came in in just a minute here. But I wanted to touch a little bit more on what well, you talked a little bit earlier on in terms of your style or this process of decisions being made through a written document getting everybody's input in before making a decision. Recently read or heard somewhere you, you, you're sharing this example, so I just think it'd be helpful for you to tell, the, tell the, everyone here today a bit more about it. Uh, when it came to COVID, um, you've created a structure from my understanding where it seems like folks can submit ideas around how they can work in this environment, what cultural values that the team should have, and, these are ideas that can be sent in via writing and then the, the winning person or team gets rewarded or, or something like that. So anyway, since you're, you're the one who has come up with this, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think it's illustrative of one of the things that you do so well. Yeah, I mean, I think backing that concept out a little bit, we have a notion of, um, we've always believed that great ideas can come from anywhere in the company, but that they don't necessarily, if you don't, create the, um, the conditions for them to emerge. And so we've tried to create the conditions for them. Uh, and that includes, for example, regular competitions with like structured prompts where the answers are graded anonymously and the winner is, you know, recognized and gets like a couple thousand bucks or whatever. And so it's like, it's meaningful money and um, it also gets people, everyone in the company thinking about the questions and, you know, oftentimes we do implement some of the ideas. And so, uh, in COVID, you know, right away we did, um, what can we do to like make this better for everyone? Uh, and you know, we wanted to hear everyone's thoughts. It was like, how's it going? How can we make it better? Whatever. Well, not how's it going? Cause that wasn't the question, but, um, and there were some good ideas and some not so good ideas. And we, we did a lot of it. And I think, you know, everyone's experience with COVID has changed over time. You know, at first, like happy hour seemed like a good idea and now they don't. Um, and, um, you know, that, that, that happened with all of these, but, but that's certainly like, I think the, the general idea of trying to create that situation for people to, uh, to be a part of the decision making, to have input is, is something that makes them feel valued and, and I think creates a good culture. That's great. And yeah, uh, I remember, and I'm sure everybody does, you know, March, April, May, 2020, where we were like, call and Zoom everybody. And now we're like, please, I don't wanna be on uh -huh. Zoom for all day and all night. But uh, Eric, this question came in and you, you touched on this a little bit earlier. And so I wanna just go back to that. Uh, about your relationship with your founders. And uh, you, you talked about this notion of being ready to, to go in on a relationship that could last 10 years or longer. So fast forward to today, how have you 
managed and maintained to, to keep that relationship strong? What does that look like uh, in present day? Yeah, you know, I am the CEO, um, but, and so I think my relationship with them depends on my perspective of them. And if I had a different perspective, I think I would have managed it differently. But notwithstanding that I'm the CEO, I view them as instrumental to the success of the business. I view both of them as instrumental. And so I think of it like a um, relationship, you know, um, and I need to understand what makes them tick and what, what makes me tick and the fights that I should have and the fights that I shouldn't have. And, you know, I, I, I'm like, you can't, you can't win every battle and you shouldn't fight every battle and you should be thoughtful about the ones that you do fight and only do those if they make it right. And then similarly, like, think about how the person on the other side is going to receive it and try to, you know, be thoughtful to their needs and come up with the best solutions. But I don't think there's any like shortcut to that if you want a good working relationship with people. Great, thank you. You also talked about COVID. So how has COVID over the past year affected the business? And then also, you know, <laughs> the team culture, how are you navigating these current times? Like everything, you know, it's affected everything. So we don't have it. We, we had like companies in 15 regions right now. I think we had nine like real offices and now we have zero. Um, the last one just shut down or the lease ended. So um, we were fortunate that our lease has ended during this time, including our New York headquarters. And that saved us a lot of money. And, um, but like nobody sees each other, right? And, and there's, no, there's no easy way around that. We do things like, uh, there's a software called icebreaker.video, which is like you meet random one-on-one -on -one people for like five minutes and like over and over again, it's great. Um, but like, you know, that, that gets to the original question of inverting the relationship. Um, and, and thinking about everything in that sense. And that's, that's what we, what we focus on. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so everything's different, right. And at some point it will go back, but like, you know, we, we focus a lot on how do we communicate effectively to the company? How, so I write an email to the company every week. That's like, and I've done this for years, by the way. But, you know, a special focus now every single week, like five, six paragraphs on whatever. Um, like just last week, I wrote on the value of um, not using monitors for as much time as you can, uh, not using screens at all. So like that includes the Peloton and whatever. Um, and then the week before I wrote on a merger of two of our competitors. And so, you know, it depends on the week and what's appropriate. But, um, you know, so I think that sort of con uh, communication. We have a big wiki with a lot of company uh, information. We've invested in, like I said, Triple F University. I think that's that's all exceedingly important in these times. As you look forward, what changes do you see to the future of how you do work at Triple Left? Do you envision opening, reopening back all those offices? Uh, just curious to hear about your initial thoughts or your current thoughts around what getting back to what things used to be like would would be in the future. I don't think people want to get back to what it precisely was before. I think, I mean, it's probably trite by now, but like, you know, that people like working from home for some amount of time and people like seeing people a little bit so they don't go crazy. And so I think we'll probably have some combination of the two, you know, had we had this conversation before COVID, I would not have been okay with it, but now it's like, it works. So that's what we're going to do, uh, which means less real estate, um, going forward. And it means more of a focus on collaborative spaces in the real estate that you do have. And you mentioned a little bit about the merger of two of your competitors. So can you talk to, talk to us a little bit about the current play or state of affairs? specifically in your space, what trends are you seeing, et cetera? I mean, my, my space is like, I mean, I don't know how much you really care about ad tech, <laughs> um, but 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, EdTech is a complicated space and it's um, always in flux. And I would say more so than usual, it's going to be a space where, you know, the sharper companies succeed and do well and the, everybody else is going to kind of get pummeled a little bit. And so, you know, the, the companies that merged were not good companies. They were kind of like tier three companies and you know, is that like two drunks propping each other up or is it going to be a, a viable competitor in the future? I don't know, but that like, that's the dynamic that's really important in our space right now. Um, and that was kind of what I talked about, but in a nicer way. Great, Eric. I know we have a little bit of time uh, left here. So I want to um, just ask you for the advice that you'd give to those who are attending today um, for students or alumni who may find themselves in this unique position of not sure what they want to do next. Perhaps they're thinking about pivoting from being at a law firm to a business or for a student trying to think through where they should go in these times. What advice would you give to them? How would you encourage them to think through that in such challenging times? Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone's experience and skills and whatever is different. So I don't know that there's like generalized good advice. Um, like my ability to do what I did was because like I had an undergrad in grad school in computer science from MIT. Like you don't like if you don't have that, you can't do exactly what I did. Um, and I don't mean to be a dick about it. It's just like, you know, that's what it was. Um, and so different people are going to be thinking about different things based on their own, you know, skills and uh, goals. Um, and so if you, it, it is the case that, um, you know, I think there were some things about the law firm that probably were helpful, but I think in the aggregate, I could be just as far along if I hadn't worked at a law firm uh, as if I had, and I probably would be better off had I gone in a different direction right out of law school, um, like going to a consulting company or something that I think gives you um, a better business focused experience uh, while still, you know, providing some of the drive and know how that, you know, a, 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 a law firm would. would. Um, and, and so I, I would, you know, if you want to go big co route, you know, go the McKinsey, BCG, Bain, Deloitte, whatever uh, angle. I think that's probably a better angle to be to be thinking. But that's that's me. Um, you know, if you if you don't want to do the stuff that law law firms do, then you know, well, like you're not going to change the law firm. Um, and it's not easy. Like the other thing is, and this it's just not easy to go from a law firm to. Um, something else like it's not easy it's hard it takes work it takes effort and you have to like you have to put yourself in a position like you can't expect people are going to make do it for you and so like there's no everything is just grind it out grind it out grind it out and you will have to take a step backwards you'll probably have to make less money you'll probably have to whatever but it's all you know if, if you believe it's in the greater good it's in the greater good and that's stuff that you've got to like um believe in and get used to like my experience is, is yeah like I, I don't know that everyone has this exaggerated of an experience but it, I, it's only possible because I took like a two-thirds pay cut um and I I don't think that's like the general case but you have to be used to like you have to be okay with the idea of taking a step back to take two steps forward Eric and I think we'll end there and I'll say that you you, you not only uh, took two steps forward, but fast forward eight plus years and you've taken leaps forward. Uh, we're incredibly proud of all that you've accomplished as one of our grads. Triple Lift continues to be named as one of the leading companies, not only in your space, but also in New York City. And so it makes me really proud personally to know you and to see the impact that you and your co-founders are having on the tech scene in New York City. So thank you for 
all that you're doing. And uh, certainly thank you for taking the time this afternoon to share so much with our students and our alumni. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Always have a lot of good laughs and uh, great conversations. So thank you so much. A big thanks to all who've attended today as well. Uh, we have a, a number of these scheduled in the coming weeks, so we'll be sharing those. Um, so stay tuned and connected via email and via a website for more details. And again, Eric, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Take care, all. Bye.